The 2020 Renault Zoe is an all-electric super mini with a 100 kilowatt motor and 52 kilowatt hours of usable battery space. It's certainly not the most expensive EV you can buy, but it's uh, not what I would call cheap. But for the right buyer, I think it might just be worth it. It's rather cute aesthetic, makes it a great choice for anyone who's not looking for a, an EV that looks like it's too futuristic, and it's rather comfortable and relaxing driving experience means that it's a great choice for a, a zip around town or your commute to work. Let's start with a look around it. Up at the front, you have some rather nice looking LED headlights, as well as the charging port hidden behind the Renault badge. It is both a Type 2 and CCS charging port, so you can use it for both AC and DC fast charging. It charges up to 22 kilowatt hours on AC or 50 kilowatt hours on DC if you buy the optional rapid charger. And it's pretty easy to, to get used to and to charge. You've also got a load of parking sensors scattered all around the car to make it nice and easy to maneuver, as if it isn't small enough already, and a bit of a grill down the bottom that is used for the heat pump that aids in heating and cooling the interior and the cabin. Around the side is where you're most likely to notice just how tall it is. It's almost SUV-esque level of height, and you do sit in a very tall, sort of commanding driving position, mostly thanks to the batteries under the floor. You may also notice just how much ground clearance this thing has, not that I would ever try and utilize it, and you'll probably also notice the length. It's got a relatively short nose, there isn't much protrusion over the front wheel, and the, the overall length is about four meters total, which is actually not too bad. The VW ID3 is, I think, about 25 centimeters longer, although a new Mini is about 20 centimeters shorter, so it's right in this super mini class. It's also a five door with some very weird door handles to boot, and you'll also notice the wheels, which uh, you can ha either have in 17s, 16s, or 15s, with the 16s and 17s being alloy options, uh, and these are wrapped in Michelin Primacy 4s, which are decent enough for a balance of road noise, grip, and efficiency. And around the back, you'll find what is a pretty flat rear end with a decent sized rear window, rear wiper and washer, and of course, you've got the boot too. This has a pretty decent amount of boot space with 338 litres with the seats folded up or a maximum of, I think, 1,225 litres with the seats folded down. It's also pretty easy to do, the button's just inside, so you just pop it and push, although the seat belts do catch, so you tend to have to go around, open the back doors and pull the seat belt out of the way for it to fall down again, but it's still relatively simple. And inside here is where you'll find your charging cables and where you'll probably end up keeping them as there isn't any other hidden spaces that you can use for this. You have the home charger with a standard three pin plug and the rather thick and rather heavy cable, uh, type two cable for charging at stuff like Tesco's pod points or pod points in general and most AC chargers. Inside the Zoe in the front seats is a pretty nice place to be. These seats are the, the GT line, I think they also come in the iconic version, uh, and these are the synthetic leather with recycled fabric. For someone of my slightly larger build, they aren't the absolute most comfortable, but I've had a few people who are a bit slimmer build than I, including my partner, uh, and they found them uh, much more comfortable, much more uh, easy to get used to. You do have plenty of adjustability. You have a standard or well, fully adjustable telescopic steering wheel. You also have forward and backward and tilting on your chair and for the rear. And you have plenty of buttons on the steering wheel, including for extra gadgets like cruise control. And you even have a lane assist and lane keep assist built in as well. All of those assists can be customized and set up in the infotainment screen, which is this one is actually really nice. It's the 9.3 inch Easy Link touchscreen tablet. Uh, and it has everything you would expect, really. You've got uh, maps and navigation built in, which is actually pretty responsive and powered by Google, which is quite nice. Uh, you've obviously got your standard selection for audio sources, digital and FM radio, all that stuff, and aux as well. And more importantly, if you use the two USB ports that are below the infotainment cluster uh, and you've optioned it up, you can use Android Auto or Apple CarPlay, which is really nice. 
The gauge cluster also integrates quite nicely, especially if you're using the navigation built into the car. That will actually show up uh, or show your next uh, instruction, your next turning on the, the center of the dashboard. And otherwise you have two dials to show you your battery usage and percentage and your power usage on the other side. The build quality, especially in the front, is a weird mix. The steering wheel, which this is actually the heated steering wheel, which is quite nice to hold. Uh, even the, the buttons, the horn, the switch gear is quite nice. Even the dashboard is sort of nice, slightly plush. But then you get the door plastics, which are the really not so great. It's the same on the uh, the glove box, which is absolutely tiny. But then you have this really nice shifter, which actually makes it really easy to swap back and forward and maneuver it around town. You have a nice metal trim on the handbrake. You even have a wireless charging pad down here to charge your phone while on the go. And moving into the back, well, I don't really fit. Um, I am six foot tall, so I am probably bigger than the target audience for the back of this car. I've got the front seat set to where I would sit if I was driving, and I don't really have any room and my head is touching the roof. If I try and sit upright in a more comfortable position for my lower back, then, well, the headrest kind of digs into my sort of center spine and I kind of have to have my head like this. Like I said, I'm not the target market for sitting in the back of this car. And if you're having your kids in here or, you know, some smaller adults, this is going to be just fine. I would mention this is technically a three seater in the back. Although I would hope that the people who are sitting back here are good friends because well, I'd be quite tight. At least you can keep them entertained with the two USB ports that are down on the floor to keep their iPads charging while you're on the go. So that's the tour around and in the inside, but what's it like to drive? The first thing that you'll notice if you're not coming from an SUV is probably the ride height. You sit well above most other drivers, and in fact, I can generally see over most people's roofs when driving around town. It's kind of strange because despite its ride heights, because the batteries are so low in the floor, you actually don't feel like you're all that high and you also don't, the car doesn't handle like it's overly tall either. Nor does it handle like it's 1.5 ton weight would suggest. Thanks to that low center of mass, it's relatively easy to control the car. It doesn't feel like it's one of the tall SUVs that wants to tip over at any moment. It feels pretty well composed. Overall, I would describe the, the car's handling as playful, but not inherently fun. Don't get me wrong, when you boot it and you press the, the throttle all the way down to the floor, that 100 kilowatts of power and the instant torque is fantastic. It's great for getting up to speed on motorways. But the overall handling of the car is definitely soft, it's definitely a bit more muted and a bit more of a relaxing, easy driving experience rather than something that's inherently fun. Of course, that is the point. The suspension is remarkably soft. You don't feel much in the way of road noise and you've probably noticed in some of the clips that there is quite a lot of diving under braking, a lot of rolling through the corners. It's not a, a tight sports car, but again, it's not meant to be. In terms of the acceleration, like I said, you have plenty of power, especially for around town. This is kind of the red light king. Weirdly enough, the throttle response, especially in eco mode, is incredibly muted. It's incredibly, not sluggish, but it's certainly not peppy with the throttle response off the line. But once you're up and running, once you're on the move, any minor jolt of the throttle does push you back into your chair. In terms of getting up to speed for motorways and staying there, this has plenty of potential to do that uh, without much issue. The budget tires on this, as you might have just heard, do fairly often give out grip. They, uh, they tend to, to skid a, a fair bit around, and so you will want to be careful when pulling off that you don't, well, end up wheel spinning. But, like I said, getting up to speed on the motorway is, is plenty fine. I, I'm now up to speed and you can hear that there is a fair bit of road noise and wind noise. That is pretty common. You do have a relatively large side surface area, so it can get swept around by the wind a, a decent amount. Um, although the stability is pretty good. 
The steering is incredibly light, which for a city car is a good thing, but when it's on the, the motorway like this, can be a little skittish, a little sort of darting around. And so it does take a bit more mental energy to keep it on the straight and narrow rather than letting it dance like it kind of wants to. Of course, the main thing that you'd be worried about when doing longer journeys in an EV like this is inevitably going to be its range. Now, the uh, Renault WLTP figure they quote for this R135 model with the, the GT line spec, that is quoted as 238 miles. Now, that would make it absolutely exceptional for its class. Uh, for a small car like this, that's fantastic. Unfortunately, in my testing, the best I've been able to get is around 180 or so miles in mostly city driving, or if you're doing longer motorway journeys, I would expect more like 100, 150 miles instead. Of course, that will vary on a lot of different factors, including things like ambient temperature, where that WLTP figure they quote is for summer around 20 degrees ambient, whereas in winter at five degrees ambient, they quote just 150 miles through the WLTP cycle. But for a city car, even 150 to 180 miles is plenty. That's enough for most people to commute to work pretty much all week and trips to the shops without any issues with you know needing to plug in during the week. Even though, again, if you're the sort of person who's going to buy this car, you'll probably want to plug it in every couple of nights overnight anyway. One of the best things about electric cars for me is their regen braking features. That's where the motor acts as a generator and slows the car down and by doing so captures or harvests that energy and stores it back in the battery. Now in this Zoe there are two main ways that you can engage the regen braking. In the standard D drive mode uh, you can just lift off the accelerator and it will start to regen brake but relatively gently. The same sort of deceleration you would expect from an, a standard internal combustion engine with its engine braking. And then once you start to press on the brake pedal, then it will engage the more full rate of regen braking. Uh, although I should mention that it does not come to a complete stop. This will creep at five miles an hour unless you are pushing the brake pedal firmly to use the friction brakes to come to a stop even while you're using the brake pedal, but just gently so you're only using the regen braking, it won't come to a complete stop. And in fact, once it, uh, can, it runs out of regen braking energy, essentially, it actually almost caught me out. I almost ran into the back of someone because it will then start creeping while your foot is still on the brake pedal. That is something that I would very much like to see improved in a, a software update, for example. Uh, because while it will only happen to you once in your, your ownership of the car, it will give you quite a fright. The other way to engage regen braking is to use the B drive mode. That is the same mode that their plug-in hybrids use to essentially charge the batteries while you're still engine braking, that kind of thing. In the plug-in hybrids, that effectively engages full regen. But the trouble with the B mode is that Despite it giving you the full force of regen while lifting off the accelerator, it's effectively the closest thing you can get to a one pedal driving option. It doesn't engage the brake lights. And that's a pretty big deal because the full force of regen braking on this is about as hard as I would press the brake pedal in my normal car, you know, unless I was emergency braking. It is a serious amount of deceleration, and the fact that the brake lights don't come on in that mode is worrying for sure. When it comes to the friction brakes down at the bottom of that pedal, they're fine. They're obviously not performance brakes, but they will do fine for stopping in an emergency or a bit heavier braking than you need from regen, or of course just coming to a complete stop. You don't really end up using them all that much, especially uh, with the, the regen enabled. And so generally speaking, they can get a little bit uh, almost gritty, especially at slow speed stops, but it's, it's still fine. You get used to it and uh, you don't need to replace them all that often. So that's a nice bonus. You can definitely have a bit of fun in the car. I found that uh, because of the, the high aspect ratio, the tall aspect ratio tires, I tend to find if you try and 
throw it into a corner, what can happen is the, the tires effectively roll over and then they literally notch themselves back into place, which is a very fun feeling, although not necessarily the most um, safe and secure, but uh, it can be a bit of fun, especially to toss it around a little, uh, you know, around the, the city streets, for example. Uh, but like I said, it's not the sort of car I would purchase if my, my primary function was to, to have fun in a car, but you can enjoy driving it if you're uh, using it for the more standard purpose. On the note of steering, as I mentioned, on faster roads like dual carriageways and motorways, it is a little light and sort of skittish for my preference, but for in and around town, which is obviously where this is kind of mainly designed for, that is a really good attribute, it's a, a nice benefit to have because it makes it incredibly easy to maneuver around tight city streets, around car parks. It's a very easily maneuverable and simple car to control. Even with the, the, the shifter, being able to change directions literally instantly, obviously from a stop, is fantastic. It makes it very easy to navigate around town, around car parks, all that sort of stuff, and to pull a U-turn in the road, that's absolutely no problem. And it's a very, like I said, easy car to, to drive to get in and get to wherever you need to go without much issue. But that's kind of the point of this car. Every aspect of it is designed to make it a, a comfortable and relaxing driving experience while you're in and around town or you know commuting to work. The suspension is nice and soft for a good reason. It is a little bit floaty, a little bit sort of wallowy, but again, that's so that you get a comfortable ride that isn't too harsh. It's a relaxing experience. You don't get much road noise, uh, generally speaking. Uh, the nice light steering, again, makes it really easy to maneuver around town. And yes, you can still have a bit of fun with it. So that's always good. And even the, the throttle input. In its eco mode, you can basically mash the pedal. And as long as you don't hit what is essentially a kick down button, a boost button at the bottom, you will stay within a, a limited power band. And so you won't be wasting your electricity. Uh, or if you leave it in a standard mode, again, you can still be what's essentially relatively ham-fisted with the inputs and still have a, a comfortable and relaxing driving experience. You do also get a couple of nice features like cruise control, which you can set on the wheel, or you can even set a speed limiter, which is really useful for if you're in and around sort of stop-start traffic, but you don't want to accidentally, well, break the speed limit. And you even have active lane keep assist if you do want to use that, although I did test that at the uh, E-Tech launch event and it did, uh, it felt like it was kind of hunting between the lines when I was using it, so it's probably a, a last resort rather than a, a nice self-driving feature for sure. But again, these sorts of assists are definitely nice to have. You even have a feature that shows you whatever the speed limit is at, cur at the current time at your current road with the camera that's on the windshield. So again, there's a nice, a few nice little sort of assists that can help again make your, your driving experience nice and easy. Now all of that sounds great, right? I mean, it's a pretty relaxing, comfortable driving experience, great for nipping to the shops with your kids or your pets. There's plenty of room inside for both kids, pets and shopping simultaneously if you like. And it's got a decent enough range, at least for a city car. So what's not to love? Well, I think the main one is gonna be its price tag. This GT Line model will set you back a cool £30,000 with the plug-in car grant. And that's a lot of money to spend on a city car, especially considering that you can buy an, a hybrid Clio from Renault themselves for almost £10,000 less. And that high barrier to entry is also almost doubled by the fact that if you don't have a driveway where you can plug this in at home, it's really difficult to use. I don't have space here to, to plug it in, and so I was using public chargers to keep it topped up. And the fact that it takes anywhere between half an hour to an hour of sitting in a car waiting for it to charge makes it a lot less convenient than I would like. And while the range is plenty, if you're just taking trips to the shops or in and around town or even for your daily commute, if you do want to go on a longer journey, it's not quite there yet. Even with the 50 kilowatt hour fast charging, in my testing, I was getting around about 150 miles from a full charge. And that was a mixture of in and around town and sort of motorway speed driving. So I imagine you'd get even less. 
on just straight motorway driving, which again, having to stop every even 150 miles for an hour to an hour and a half to fill it back up again, it's not the most practical, and especially considering that Clio would do it, uh, do that mileage there and back on a single tank of fuel and then some, I think I would know, I know which one I would rather buy. This is clearly a great option for a household's second car, one that can afford the asking price and has a spare slot on the driveway that they can plug it in overnight. If that is you, this is an exceptional option. It's a very cute aesthetic, is really easy to drive, and is a great, like I said, commute to work, trip to the shops, all that sort of stuff. It's a great option. But if you can't afford the £30,000 asking price or the £6,000 deposit and £200 a month just for the base model, and you don't have a place to charge it at home, I think you're probably gonna need to wait for the next generation or two before something like this Zoe makes sense to you. Looking back at the last couple generations of Zoe, I am incredibly impressed how far Renault has brought this in just the last few years. I'm really excited to see the, the next generations of Zoe and if the range can come up, the charging can get a bit faster. This should be an, an incredible option for a pretty wide range of people. But for the time being, if you're in the, the target market for this, then definitely check this out. It's a great drive and I think might suit you quite well. But if you're not, then, well, Renault has some other options too. So that is my review of the, the Renault Zoe ZE50. If you're interested in seeing more reviews like this one, then hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon. I've got a video on how to charge an EV coming out next week, so make sure you're subscribed for that. Check out more videos on the end cards. There's plenty of you to choose from, including my own Audi S4 review, if you're interested in checking that out. Otherwise, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, leave those in the comments down below. We'll see you all in the next video.